Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, Intel's tiny Ivy Bridge boxes of goodness. GeForce GTX 650 buy versus build laptops with missing SATA drives. The search for a perfect benchmark in Borderlands 2. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 187, recorded September 20th, 2012. Maybe we can shoot the router. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, and this is the show where we try to tell you the most important and exciting news in computer hardware so you can make the right decisions when you're building your PC, working on your Mac, or taking a look at your next tablet. Joining me as always, Mr. Ryan Shrout, who looks to be back at home. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing well. I am at home. Uh, we had a snarky email conversation back and forth with Burke when I said, luckily, I am not in studio. And I meant, I'm glad to be home. I'm glad to not be out of town anymore. Not that I didn't want to hang out with you and Burke in studio, but I like to hang out at my house sometimes, too. Doesn't happen as often as I would like. Yeah. Well, you know, we are several thousands of miles from the location of the woman you love and married, so I would hope you would want to actually go home once in a while. Every Just once in a while. Saying. Borderlands 2, not necessarily yes. the most stressful game on a PC. Uh, it's the Unreal Engine, right? Uh, but you said yep. uh, 1080p best settings, GTX 660 or Radeon HD 7870. That would be your baseline for the best gaming experience graphics-wise. Yeah, we, we played uh, – we actually had – we did a, a an event with NVIDIA yesterday where we played Borderlands on a live stream for about four and a half hours. I watched some uh, of that. I was actually using a 660 Ti at the beginning of that, but prior, earlier in the day, I had been using just a base, one of the brand new uh, GTX 660s that we talked about last week. And uh, running at 1080p with everything turned up all the way, uh, including PhysX, on high was 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 more than acceptable. There are a couple of cases where we saw frame rates dip down into the low 30s, maybe into the 20s when there was a lot of stuff going on. So that's why we actually went ahead and upgraded to a 660 Ti uh, when we did the live stream. So, uh, but you know, it's it's not the most demanding game. It has a very unique art style. If you if you've never played any of the border, either the first one or or this new one, uh, mm -hmm. it has kind of like a cell shaded, almost kind of like a comic book cartoon type of look yeah. to it but it's really cool it's not childish looking it's it's definitely an m-rated game uh but it's uh it's a whole lot of fun and it's 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 interesting to see we're gonna have uh we're working on a, a benchmarking method for it uh here maybe we'll have it tomorrow uh and we'll be able to run some cards through it the the big thing that nvidia is pushing with it is physics integration and i know Physics has uh, a lot of negative connotation with it, which it, it's it's deserved. A lot of it is deserved. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, they they basically all they did was work with the Gearbox, the developer of Borderlands Two, and make sure that like fluids work a little bit differently. There's a lot more particle effects. Uh, the cloth is actually mm -hmm. interactive as opposed to just static animations and that kind of stuff. And it's you don't need any of it. You can still play the game without right. it, uh, but it works pretty well, and it's and it does add something to it I, I like what the one of the reviewers at kotaku was was basically like i'm just running around so i can watch myself run through puddles and shooting tarps and he's like until ea has its first sharp tooting sh like tarp shooting title borderlands <laughs> 2 is it but it's it, you laugh right but this is finally the first time i've looked at something and been like wow physics is cool i want a card with physics just so i can play borderland and have all the really cool effects and it's like this that's, is neat that's the congratulations point. nvidia yeah, I mean that's that's the goal, right? And and there's there's some crap that goes along with it. Like, could you integrate this on uh, AMD cards? Maybe is Nvidia right. going to spend money and development time on it? Absolutely <laughs> not. That's 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 not in their best interest. Right. Uh, as many times as companies say that they're out for the the interest of the the gamer, it's always the gamer and themselves, right? So uh, you can enable like there, you actually can't disable physics. It's either low, medium, or high. Right. And I actually got a pretty good explanation of it uh, when we did the stream yesterday from one of the NVIDIA reps who said low is uh, essentially the setting that you get when you play Borderlands on a console. 
So that that's the same uh, amount of physics simulation you'll get like on a console. Uh, when you enable medium, it uh, starts. It actually enables the GPU accelerated physics. You get particles and and cloth and that kind of stuff. And when you go to high, it actually just increases the amount of those items. So uh, you know you can play around with those settings and and, and find a, a good balance. But it's a really fun game. Um, like I said, we if you really really want to watch four and a half hours of us BSing and playing the game, we we posted that video on YouTube. You know, how big was that video, Ken? Like when we when we first got it off, it was like six gig video. That we upload to YouTube um, for not really useful purposes, but uh, it's there. Yeah, and we should point out uh, Caffeine Free Dave says in the chat room, but that's one of the reasons I stopped PC gaming, couldn't afford updating the PC with every other new game. Uh, and the reality is, is you probably don't have to upgrade anything inside nope. your system to run this, doing this. It has fairly low barrier of entry. You only have to upgrade, you know, and the truth is right now is a great time for PC gaming because you get so much performance for so little money in terms of GPUs, and most people are using 1080p screens, and 1080p screens are not taxing even the medium cards that are out there. The only time you really need like a $600 card is if you're using one of the higher res monitors or doing multiple right. monitor gaming. Yeah. Um, we should probably skip right to what to me is the most exciting story today because everybody knows I'm cheap. GeForce GTX 650, $109 for Kepler GPU goodness. Is it worth buying, sir? Probably not. <laughs> uh, that was hard. We haven't. We haven't. I mean, it's so. Here, here's my issue: the the, the six sixty Ti is based on GK one hundred four, same part as six seventy and six eighty. The six sixty vanilla, just the plain six sixty, is based on GK one hundred six. It has nine hundred and sixty stream processors, I think. The GTX six fifty is actually based on GK one hundred seven, I believe or a cut down version of 106 but the point of it is it drops from 960 cores to 384 cores so it's a dramatic drop in performance you also go from 192 bit to 128 bit memory bus and uh you go from two gigs to one gig of frame buffer uh that you know it, look at the price gap there you're going from 109 dollars for the 650 to 229 dollars for the 660 that's a that's a pretty wide gap and you're going to see that type of performance gap as well as you know the, the pricing gap. Um, it'll be a good upgrade for people that have integrated graphics and don't want to spend a lot of money. That, that's what it's going to be for. I haven't gotten my hands on to test with it yet. It's got to be better than that awful GT640 that is, that is also a GK107 part. Uh, I don't know how much better it will be. I'm, guess, I'm guessing, you know, I assume NVIDIA is a pretty smart company uh, and they're going to price things according to the performance levels. So I assume the GTX 650 is going to perform significantly closer to the GT 640 than it is the GTX 660. Hmm. Um, so for a gamer, somebody who's interested in Borderlands 2, even if you're not interested in playing it on maximum settings, I would still say don't buy the 650 unless you have these extreme cost restrictions. If you can afford to get up to a 660 or on the AMD side, like a 7850 or 7870, that's where you're going to see, you know, what I would consider the mainstream gaming cards as opposed to entry level gaming cards. I don't know. It's, it's, it, and I'm not super excited about it. I haven't been really eager to like, I haven't been knocking down doors to get a review right. sample of this just because, <laughs> you know, in their own benchmarks, they're comparing it to the GTS 450 and right. they are saying it's only 20% faster. So if they mm. are saying it's only 20% faster, it's probably a little bit less than that. <laughs> um, and the GTS 450 is just not a card that really gets, you know, the type of people really that listen to our show or watch our right. show generally really excited. Keep saving your pennies, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Give and that extra month. Tim Vary on PC Perspective, AMD binning Trinity APUs with defective GPUs as CPU-only Athlon processors. Uh, is there a problem with that? Doesn't particularly bother me. No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't see a problem with it. I mean, they're pretty up, you know, upfront about what it is. I, I like the, the continuation of the Athlon brand because that was one of the kind of defining characteristics of what made AMD so popular uh, back when the first Athlons were released. Uh, the, you know, it's 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 a smart move. You've got these pieces of silicon where uh, the GPU part is 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 uh, 
not working correctly, can't run at the speeds of any part that you've advertised and are selling. Let's just disable the whole thing and sell it as a really low cost CPU. Uh, so you get like the Athlon, Athlon X4 730, 740 or 750. Uh, you know, all the way up to 2.8, 3.2, or 3.4 gigahertz. Now, they're not super fast processors, uh, and, and they don't have integrated graphics. So where does this put it in the market? It's kind of a, of a tentative area. Um, pricing is going to have to be really aggressive to make these interesting because you still need... So what's interesting about this product is you would have to have an A75 motherboard or below, something like that, this processor, but then you also have to have a discrete graphics card. Right, because you can't, you don't have integrated graphics. Like in my opinion, the the the, the success of Lano and Trinity that it has had is because okay, I got one chip and it's got CPU and GPU on it, and it's a better GPU than what I can get on Intel's integrated parts. With this, you do not get that integrated GPU, so you know it's a lot less attractive to anybody thinking down that target, especially considering now even to get basic graphics support, you're going to have to get a discrete card. Right. So they, I mean, and let, I don't think it lists. I don't think Tim had pricing on this yet. Um, I know they did this similarly with the Lano parts, mm -hmm. uh, and they weren't, in my opinion, priced aggressively enough to be beneficial to the market. Right. Like if these were sixty dollars parts, that would be great. You know, you maybe it's about half the price because you're getting half of the you know half the transistors working uh, essentially. But I don't, I don't, I don't think they're going to be down down that low but we'll we'll see relatively soon uh, as trinity starts to leak out on the desktop side yeah amd is in a tough position to do uh cpus only um yeah because just thinking of, uh. <laughs> moving on small form factor intel nook uh, uh, next unit of computing is what they're calling it the nook pc or nook 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 uh coming sure. in october for under 400 dollars. unfortunately named but i think actually really <laughs> cool um so it's a really tiny motherboard, four inches by four inches. Um, uh, so mini ITX, six by seven by six by seven. Again, this is another uh, Tim Vary article up on PCPro.com. Via's Pico ITX form factor boards measure 3.9 by 2.7. Uh, so the Nook is not the smallest PC you can build, but it will be the fastest. And by, quote, a significant margin thanks to the bundled Ivy Bridge CPU, unquote. So what we have here is essentially a desktop uh, ready PC or a home theater ready PC. It's a small four by four inch box or board. You can integrate it into a box. You can attach to a home theater. You can use the desktop computer. I have visions of using it uh, as a server device, at least if, oh, there it is. If you just scroll down a little bit, you see uh, on the back of the picture up on pcper.com, uh, USB, which I would hope would be USB 3.0 when it ships, HDMI, and what looks to be, yes, ladies and gentlemen, a Thunderbolt port. If we mm -hmm. slide up just a little bit, oh, you can see it right there. Uh, <laughs> HDMI and then the Thunderbolt and then the dual HDMI and Ethernet. So uh, could be a really interesting uh, server box uh, with the Ethernet. I would like Ethernet and Thunderbolt so I can make a server box with right. epically fast external storage. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting nice. to watch this involve. So two SO DIMM slots for RAM, M SOTA port for an SSD, mini PCI Express slot for a Wi-Fi card, and... Basically, one motherboard is going to have three USB 2.0 ports, one HDMI output, and one Thunderbolt port. So, obviously, they have not consulted with me to find the board that I want. <laughs> uh, the other board will have a three USB 2.0 ports, two HDMI outputs, and one gigabit Ethernet jack. Intel believes that the Thunderbolt-equipped model will be more popular with consumers, while the gigabit Ethernet and dual HDMI model will be used more by businesses. Uh, I, think, I think the limitation you're running into here is more on space on the PCB right. to both have... Uh, a, a gigabit controller and then try to also fit a Thunderbolt controller on there. Thunderbolt controllers are not integrated into anything. Uh, I imagine right. just in physical spacing is where you have that issue, not really in uh, uh, like, you know, back panel spacing or anything like that. So, but it's interesting, you know, it's kind of, I won't say it's an attack on Raspberry Pi, but it's, it's right. going after the same idea of Raspberry Pi. Well, is that. With one massive important distinctive difference, this is a four hundred dollar board box chassis thing, right? And you, you know, you're talking yeah. about a significant performance improvement. Raspberry Pi is selling for thirty five bucks, um, you know, but the the performance this only difference order of magnitude is larger. 
Yeah, Intel i3, 3270. Well, it's about, I think it looks like it'd be about twice the size, but, you know, <laughs> uh, Core i3, 3717U CPU, 4 gigs of RAM, Wi-Fi card, 40 gigabyte Intel SSD. Okay, so it would be like 400 bucks with 4 gigabytes of RAM, the Wi-Fi card, right. and an Intel I mean, that's, SSD. That's pretty cool. Is, that's, a, that's a pretty powerful system. If you compare yeah. that to the performance you get out of a Raspberry Pi, it's not even close. Yeah. Um, Ken did just bring me this just to say, hey, if you got that Thunderbolt port, here's a Thunderbolt to... It's a gigabit Ethernet adapter that Apple sells, right? right. So you can uh, you still have that option there. Well, wanna, that means you're going to have to chain it as long as your external drive enclosure has two Thunderbolt ports. Correct, because you have one Thunderbolt port and one Ethernet adapter means no more devices. So it's not like, a guarantee. <laughs> You just got to pick the right parts. I know. And that's why you should be listening to us here on <laughs> This Week in Computer Hardware, which, by the way, if this is your first This Week in Computer Hardware experience, twit.tv slash twitch, T-W-I-C-H, is the place to find all of our podcasts to subscribe, or you can search for it on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. And if you want to email us, we answer questions later in the show. Twit, excuse me, twitch at twit. Dot .tv is the email address. And I'll say that one more time. T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. Uh, so kind of strange. OCZ has exploded in the past mm-hmm. few years and kind of, to me, out of nowhere, uh, the CEO's gone. What's the story? Nobody knows for sure. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where, oh, the CEO is resigning or whatever. But the, the general consensus is that it was it was more of a push out by the board of directors. You know, OCZ as a company has survived so many different transitions in the industry. They went from being, you know, they've done memory. They've done video cards. They do power supplies. They've done CPU coolers. I mean, you name it. And, and chances are they have been involved in it in some way or the other. In the last couple of years, they've really doubled down on SSDs. You know, what, what the CEO leaving actually means is, is it's, it's hard to tell. Um, it, some people might have guessed, well, you know what, they're changing. They, they're, they're unhappy with the direction, the OCZ, that, has, that they've gone with the SSD markets. And I don't think that's really the case. I think um, there's one possibility that the board of directors really wants to kind of get away from the consumer side of solid state and go strictly into enterprise and they didn't want to do that, or it was the other way around, where the, the Ryan Peterson, who was a CEO, really wanted to push strongly into enterprise, and they said, you know what, this is a losing battle for us. Maybe we want to go back and really focus on the consumer side. Uh, we, you know, I think we'll be able to tell in the next six months which direction they actually go in through uh-huh. all of this. Uh, but you know, we had some questions about it, and will this affect Warren? It's the company's not shutting down or anything like that. They're right. still. You know, uh, still, still a solid company on on good footing and everything like that. There were rumors we talked about uh, Seagate. I think you have Seagate that maybe wanted to acquire OCZ. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen, and maybe they were blaming the CEO for that. So they wanted him out to get somebody in that maybe would prep the company for acquisition in a little bit uh, more efficient manner. I don't know. There's there was a lot there, but I know it was uh, making the rounds in the news uh, in the hardware world. So I wanted to make sure we kind of addressed it and said. If you're buying OCZ SSDs, it's really not a big deal. Right. It's just you can still do that. <laughs> it's still safe. Yeah. AMD Sea Islands HD 8850 and 8870 specs leaks. Again, Tim Vary up in PCPro.com. Quote, AMD beat NVIDIA to the punch with its 7000 series Southern Islands graphics cards. And if the rumors hold true, the company may well accomplish the same feat with its next generation architecture. Codename Sea Islands, the architecture of AMD's 8800 series is set to allegedly debut around January 2013. DX11, uh, GPGPU, power efficiency improvements, 3.4 billion transistors on a 28 nanometer process, and a rumored sub $300 price. What will the performance? Well, I mean, it's kind of it, it. It's going to be interesting. You're you're talking about like another s- wow, uh, six hundred million chips over the the uh, Pitcairn, the HD seventy eight seventy, right? Twenty percent here it is. Twenty percent more. Twenty one percent more processors. Twenty seven percent larger die size. Five uh, percent higher base clock, and they're claiming a seventy five percent improvement in computing performance. Right, that's that's kind of the big one. That's you know, huge. They're adding thirty percent more. Well, they're adding, I don't know. Let's say twenty to thirty percent more transistors. They're going from two point eight to three point four, which puts it right in line with what Kepler is today. But they're getting a seventy five percent increase in performance, 
with only a 5% increase in clock speed, right? So uh, that gives you an idea of where you're at in terms of shader counts. And we also kind of, we can guess, because I think there's a, there's a line in here that they're increasing it to 1,792 shaders. And I believe, uh, does it have 1,500 on um, Tahiti? I believe it does. So we're not seeing a huge increase in shader count, which means they're probably going to pretty significantly change the architecture of each individual shader inside the GPU as well. You know, it's all kind of guessing at this point. Uh, but a 75% increase in single precision computing powers is very significant considering you're using 9% less power and according to the rumors, 20% lower cost out of the hmm. gate, right? So $279 is the rumored launch price, whereas the 7870 launched at 349 Now today it's at like 259 but it launched at 349. So, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a tidbit and rumor about Sea Islands, uh, which we knew was going to be the next generation of architecture. Uh, but, you know, in terms of time frames, I think you're looking at March at the earliest type right. thing for this. Don't, don't, don't put off buying a graphics card thinking you're going to wait for a Sea Islands part just because you see some of these rumors, which is normally the next the question we get the week after stories like this. <laughs> the week after stories. Yeah. <laughs> It just sounds so raw. <laughs> should we talk about uh, Intel's latest Why Die, or should we take a moment uh, and move forward to our viewer questions, Mr. We Schreiber? can go ahead. We, we can move on. That's that's cool. Why, well, I'll just real quickly say, Why okay. Die 3.5, much lower latency. This is good. I haven't tested it yet, but there's a possibility you may be able to actually... I don't think it's fast enough for gaming. You may be able to use it as like a secondary monitor uh, with mouse and keyboard and not notice any lag, right, which you, would be really cool. If you're not familiar with Intel's WiDi, it's uh, Intel's wireless display technology. It's generally right. bundled with notebooks. Uh, you get an external adapter to connect one of the HDMI ports on your HDTV and allows you to go from your notebook to your HDTV. The latency issue that, that Mr. Trout mentioned uh, is, is because there's a big hang time. It goes right. from the computer to the WiDi to the WiDi to the HDTV, and it's not really fast enough for gaming. Uh, fine if you're watching movies, not so good if you're playing Twitch games. So, uh, are they talking about? They're claiming a 10x reduction in latent reduction, reduction, yes. a reduction yeah. in latency. I think we're talking about sub 50 milliseconds now. Wow, that's pretty. So high. it's pretty good. It's pre it's not good enough for like high speed gaming because sure. that's that's like an entire additional trip to a server and back um, for a lot of people. <laughs> But it, it could be enough for really kind of basic gaming and just normal use case right. productivity stuff. So it's cool. The WiDi, in case you aren't familiar with it, does support uh, current, excuse me, existing Intel WiDi features. Uh, include full HD, HD, CP2, DVD, Blu-ray, 5.1, surround sound. So uh, it's it yep. has come a long way since the initial releases of WiDi. Indeed. All right. Chad. Email question we've been waiting a couple weeks to answer. <laughs> I apologize for taking so long, Chad. He says, I'm thinking of upgrading my laptop by replacing the two 225-gigabyte drives that came installed with a 120-gigabyte SSD for the operating system and some Steam games, and the second drive would be a 2.5 1-terabyte hard disk drive, 2.5-inch 1-terabyte hard disk drive. I don't want that many programs on it, but most of the time, the default file path always prefers the C drive with a growing trend to have the SSD as the boot and a larger storage drive will operating systems start making default save paths to the storage drive to not wear out the SSD or does the save path have to stay as a C drive since there should in theory always be a C drive oh boy um, the first thought is stop worrying about wearing out your SSDs stop Yeah. stop worrying about wearing out your SSD I think the bigger issue is whether or not you will run out of space on your SSD <laughs> um because uh, I've run into people who are like, they have their SSD, they have Photoshop and their SSD, and all of a sudden after like seven photo shoots, they're like, I'm out of space. Well, duh, you, you've got the 120 gigabyte hard drive and, and you've got, you know, 80 yep. gigabytes of photos on it. Um, what would you recommend in this situation, Mr. Shroud? I mean, you want to have the SSD as your boot drive. Right. I think it makes sense to have the, 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 the 225 gig just kind of extra on the side. Uh, you may consider saving a little bit more money getting one of the 240 gig SSDs if you're kind of worried about it. Um, you know, like, for example, if you're doing gaming, Steam kind of has, I think it's still in beta, a feature that will now let you install games to a non-primary drive. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it used to be that it only went into C colon slash program file slash Steam, right. uh, but now you can you can specify separate separate folders. Uh, that would definitely help. You could point it to that other drive. Um, I, I tend to be more on the side of have your SSD and just use it exclusively, except when you have really long term storage goals. If you have a bunch of movies uh, and music. Put that on the other drive. It doesn't need right. to have super high or super low latency. Rather, it doesn't even have super high um, transfer speeds. But you just want to have access to it. Um, for your games, you want to get the benefit of that solid state drive. You want it to start a little bit faster. You want it to load a little bit faster. Um, I, I think uh, that would be a, for a machine that has two 225 gig traditional hard drives. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you, you'd see a pretty big performance gain by moving to a SSD plus other yeah. drive. Um, and, and I don't think you need to worry about, I don't know, look at your current hardware. To me, for my laptop, it's not my primary machine. So 120 gigs lasts me a long time mm-hmm. for what I do on a laptop. But that's because I, I do a lot of my work on a desktop machine. If you only have a laptop, yeah, that, that's, that's right. probably going to be an issue. You ha- you're going to have to manage it a little bit more. But that's the uh, world we live in when <laughs> solid state's still a little bit on the high price side. First world no, problem. It still is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, my uh, my hard drives are too fast, but too small as well. Rumors in the, uh, rumors in the uh, chat room is that the steam feature allows you to assign it to another drive actually is in, is a full version, not a beta. Uh, okay. Has anyone experienced SSD rams Al frame? I have, uh, and it's, you know, it may be faster than a single drive, but it's impossible to tell because a single SSD is already so much faster than a, uh, uh, excuse me, it may be possible to benchmark, but in terms of me using a computer, the SSD, the SSD, a single SSD is so fast, uh, RAID SSD, I guess, unless you maybe unless I, I, if I was moving, if I was saving multi terabyte files, I would probably notice the difference, but I can't afford a multi terabyte RAID. Yeah. RAID SSDs don't make any sense to me. Um, really, <laughs> unless you're doing super you're high speed. Lead. Rides, reads or writes, maybe. I would rather have, I would much rather have one 240 gig SSD than two right. 120 gigs. Uh, and in terms of cost wise, they should be the same either way. That's, that's just, that's just me. I mean, S- SSDs are at the point now where you're, even the most cost efficient SSDs are going to be saturating the SATA 6 bus, or in this case, he's probably got a machine that has SATA 3 in it. So that wouldn't make much sense. You don't want to like mirror them. <laughs> get your, okay, get your that, raid that one on. Okay, that makes sense. If you're going to do that, then yeah, you can do a mirror. I support that wholly. <laughs> Backups, drive redundancies, all that kind of stuff. I meant raid zero. It doesn't make any sense to do raid right. zero uh, for SSDs, in my opinion. If you do raid yeah. one, it's hard to get past that mental block of paying twice as much per gig. Well, Think for a lot of people, you could also do the RAID zero because you want to stripe and create an artificially larger RAID drive. But yeah, that was that was one of the stranger things about the Acer S5. Like that notebook, the little motorized door scares me. Uh, the RAID on the SSDs just puzzled me. Nice, nice. light notebook though, fast. Yep. Doug says my Toshiba ta- <laughs> my Toshiba satellite laptop powers on to BIOS setup. It lists the hard drive and optical disk drive as none. I tried the load setup defaults. It didn't help. Any suggestions? Yes. Um, one of the biggest, I used to have a computer that would do this uh, until I shoved a little tiny bit of matchbook cover in between the end of the hard drive and the external of the enclosure because it was, uh, for some reason, uh, the PCI connector on it. Excuse mm-hmm. me, the... Uh, SATA. Thank you. No, before SATA. IDE. Um, oof. That's the one. It's been so long. <laughs> oh, how oh how we forget our old interfaces. Uh, the for some reason the IDE um, the IDE connectors were loose, and for some reason wedging a piece of paper in there actually wedged the hard drive to the point where it would actually operate. Uh, and two years later, it was still operating. Um, I, I did that. I did that exact same thing with an SSD in one of my first <laughs> Lenovo X two ones. It was it was an it was a replacement SSD. So it, it was. It didn't have the cri- mounting things on it, so it was a little bit loose. So I shoved a piece, of, a folded piece of paper up a bunch of times and wedged it in there, and then right. shut the door on it. So obviously, Ryan and I both want you to figure out where your your hard drive is inside of your notebook, Doug, uh, and basically pull it out, reboot it, 
shut it down, unplug it, put it back in, yeah. you know, wedge it in place if necessary, uh, you know, and see if it boots. Um, generally speaking, uh, there's one of two things going on. Either your SATA drive is dead. Well, one of multiple things going on. Either your SATA drive is dead, either your connection to your SATA drive uh, is having issues, or um, for some reason the entire sort of SATA portion of your motherboard has taken uh, ill and because yeah. it bothers me if your if your hard drive and your optical disk drive are both MIA in the BIOS, that may mean, Correct. you know, is there is there possibly, you know, a BIOS for some reason? Like, you know, did you do a firmware upgrade in your BIOS? Maybe for the yeah, wrong. It doesn't sound like he did. My my, I would lean towards uh, if you, if it's a SATA connection or maybe an IDE right. connection. You didn't mention how old the machine was. Uh, that it may be that that connection to the motherboard has become disconnected or loose or broken. The fact that both of them are gone. Uh, I'm assuming he has both a hard drive and an optical disc and neither of them show up. Um, you know, if, if it's a, if it's, if it's a standard SATA drive, you can always take it out of a laptop and try to hook it up to another machine and make sure that it still sees the drive. Uh, You don't have to boot off of it. Just put it down as a secondary drive. Uh, and then you know that the problem doesn't lie with that. Which is a plus, I guess. So, plus yeah. I, I, if you've got cables you can wiggle around, this is the time to try it. Yeah, that's always a painful moment. It, it's just, it's so bad when, it's so bad when notebooks die because there's so little you can do. Like, yeah, you know, if your heart, I mean, if, you, if your drive dies, okay, you can swap in another drive. But right. if your drive dies and you don't have access to a spare drive, then you have to buy a spare drive so you can try to get it to recognize the spare drive. Uh, and then if it doesn't work, you end up owning a new notebook and your dead notebook and the spare drive, and you buy a 2.5-inch enclosure for it because you probably can't return <laughs> it once you've opened the plastic. Oh, Correct. see if you've got a buddy with a 2.5-inch drive you can borrow. Mark, do, should we do Mark's question next before sure. I get all sad about the sad yes, problems? Yes, let's do. <laughs> uh, Mark says, hi, Patrick and Ryan. Viewer here since the screensaver days on Tech TV. Good seeing you transition so well. Thank you, Mark. It's good to still be seen. He says, I'm curious <laughs> about AMD and Intel APU developments. So far, I've only heard you guys contrast the new Intel effort against their older effort, saying there is a great improvement. But how does Intel's new architecture compare to AMD's old architecture, Lano, and their new, if possible? It's faster. Also, for Ryan, it would be nice to have a more real-world subjective comparisons between chips as well as those very targeted benchmarks. For example, I had both an i7 Sandy Bridge and an FX8150 system. I couldn't tell any difference at all gaming with the same video card and comparable components. Am I insane? As for doing virtualization on them, the AMD system was much smoother under loads while the Intel one got oddly choppy. Mm. However, browser performance on the Intel chip with flash running was more fluid than the AMD. I know this kind of information is more difficult to present, but it seems far more relevant than benchmarks that often don't have much to do with normal experience. I'm not biased for or against a brand name, but I am price performance conscious. A user experience will be large users experience. Excuse me. A user's experience will be largely affected by what tasks they routinely perform, not what a benchmark result is. I would really love to hear subjective reviews, too, like a car and driver magazine review. First of all, I will say actually that that PC Per and the other uh, hardware websites do do uh, subjective testing along with their objective testing. The issue is is there are thirty two thousand user experiences, and you've you've heard yes. us talk to workstation. We, we've had people ask us like, "Hey, I'm going to be doing gigantic CAD CAM work. Like, I piece together offshore oil rigs, and I have to have discrete entries for thirty two thousand parts and thirty two hundred different kinds of steel and thirty seven thousand different types of plastic and tubing and copper and you think i'm being ridiculous but there's these amazing cad cam rigs where basically they design entire skyscrapers inside of a single application and if they change the spec for a screw from this screw to that screw it'll instantaneously change that across every single instance of that screw uh in the skyscraper or the offshore oil rig or if they change the price it will automatically calculate how it changes the price or you know what i mean and, and it's incredibly complicated and incredibly amazing and it's also like you know, there's maybe a few thousand people doing this or a few, you know, you know what I mean? There's tens of thousands of people doing this. Games, right, which are the primary reason people buy new graphics cards, that's how you benchmark graphics cards. Um, you know, games also make a really good metric for the comparison of the performance of the processor right. itself because, you know, a huge percentage of the people that are using computers, they browse the web, they use the Facebook, they've got the email, they do the checking. 
you know, they added a photo here and there, you know what I mean? And, and you know, half the people, three-quarter of the people using computers don't really, you know, bejeweled. Love it. Not a big challenge of your CPU or your GPU. It's when you start getting into audio editing, video editing, you know, CAD cam, 3D rendering, and uh, as things get more complicated, yeah, then all of a sudden your CPU and your GPU get really important. The problem is, is trying to figure out every subset of that. I love how you mentioned like virtualization, the AMD systems was much smoother under loads while the Intel one got oddly choppy. Did both systems have the same amount of memory? Were you using the same applications? Were you using the same, you know, installed application on that? Did you have the same firmware updates? Were the, you know, firmware and BIOS updates for the chipsets and all the subcomponents in there? Did you have comparable hard drives on both? And when you start doing cross-platform comparisons, um, you know, it used to be a thousand years ago, and I know Ryan's run into this, like chip company B would send you a system and it would have like $7,000 worth of components. They'd be like, test our system and see how fast it is. And I had a, I had a really, really nice guy who was a really serious marketing guy go ballistic on me. Cause I took literally $6,000 worth of hardware outside of his computer and put in a normal hard drive, you right. know, in, in a normal amount of RAM and then benchmarked it apples to apples against the competitor. And he's like, why did they you do like that? that? And I'm like, because there's like eight people who are going to buy a $6,000 worth of hardware to go in a $1,000 worth of, you know, you yep. know CPU and memory. And he's correct. like, you know what I mean? So, but they, what they wanted to do was to catch you going like, wow, Team Z's CPU is amazingly fast because you were supposed to be too stupid to recognize that they had thousands of dollars worth of hard drives and other accessories in there. Um, it's really hard to do comparisons that are meaningful to everyone who's going to read the article. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't say anything more than that. That that is exactly the case, right? That the reason we have to use these objective tests as opposed to the subjective ones is because they are repeatable, and right. we know the input and output. output. Uh, and, and, and that type of thing. We, we do do some subjective stuff, but a lot of times what we'll see is we'll get the opposite of, of, of what uh, Mark is saying here. Well, they'll take the objective stuff and say that it's bias or that it, there's no numbers behind it, so it doesn't mean anything. Um, just because it feels different to you doesn't mean it actually had. It could be a placebo effect. It could be all kinds of things that are adjusting yeah. it, right? So we, we try to find a balance, especially if you look at our graphics card reviews. We, we have numbers and we have subjective stuff as well in that. So uh, we, we try to do both cases. You know, we, we'll keep that in mind, Mark, going forward and, and that kind of stuff. But it is very hard to cover yeah. all aspects that everybody wants to see. If you have specific yeah. requests, absolutely email them. Like if you say, hey, I'm using this virtualization software uh, with Windows 7 and, and this hardware and, it, and you have these two things back and forth. I'd really like to see how this performs under this. Send, send me an email. I mean, I can't guarantee we'll look at everything, but uh, you know, if it's interesting, we'll, we'll definitely do that. We have processor releases coming up very soon, so it's time to start looking at that stuff again. I want you to open up 100 windows in Firefox, another 20 windows in Chrome, have at least three YouTube video streams playing simultaneously while running two virtual machines coding software. Okay. Tell yeah, you, sure. man. That's the benchmark. <laughs> yeah. It is it is a benchmark. Yes. <laughs> you know, if Ryan could reach out through the internet and smack me right now, my head would be going. <laughs> it's, it, 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 the question is, who is that a use case for? Is it is it a worst case? Right. Yes. What is it a use case for? And that's the type of thing that it, it's kind of hard to nail down. Because several when, hundred programmers in the United States. <laughs> right. Well, when when we had when uh, multi core multi threading right. first started to become a thing, it became very popular to try to do multi. Uh, tasking testing and it was very difficult like okay right. i'm going to try to encode this video while i play doom 3 or whatever it was at the time right let's see what our doom 3 frame rates are here and it, and it's it, it became like a, a cat and mouse game trying to figure out which ones of these actually worked which of them gave you reliable numbers you know you could you could do that thing where you encoded three times and played doom 3 and the encode would take three totally different amounts of time because right. it all depended on how the operating system and processor balanced the load in a right. given instance so it's yeah. a tough tough problem benchmarking is non-trivial and and i you know to mm -hmm. amplify something that ryan just said repeatable benchmarks um something you can do over and over again and the results actually you know mean the same thing or actually you achieve the same results multiple times mark is a huge deal um yep and it's really you know and it's kind of funny all it takes is you know 
Fire, you know, <laughs> current versions of Firefox or are, are, are don't have like the memory leak issues. But it's amazing how right. having a single the way having a single application running in the background can completely change the benchmark results on two different machines or on the same machine running multiple times. Mm-hmm. And if you don't mm-hmm. zero everything out, you, you you don't want to be in a situation where you blame the hardware when it's something that you overlooked. Uh, you know, <laughs> oh, the we, we, Skype we was running in the background. <laughs> yeah, we had an issue here the other day. We were trying to run some benchmarks on a on a motherboard, mm-hmm. and we had previously done overclocking testing on that board. And you could go back into the BIOS, and we thought we had set everything. As far as I could tell, we had set everything back to its default status, but right. the performance numbers we were getting were higher than they were supposed to be, <laughs> higher than everybody else. We're like, oh, that's kind of weird. And finally, you, you figure out that, well, the CPU is running at its maximum frequency when it's only supposed to be running at you know two steps of turbo boost, but it's actually running at four. Something is obviously wrong. Go to right. the BIOS, nothing changes anything. Suddenly, you, you do a clear CMOS on it, reboot, everything works fine. And there's those types of uh, kind of hiccups that happen in, in this world all the time. I don't know. We might be getting too much behind the scenes, but uh, benchmarking is not as simple as installing a piece of hardware right. and running a single application. Like there's not, I wish, trust me, it would make my life a hundred times easier if I could just turn on, boot up Windows, copy some files over and have a button that I would push and all these numbers would come out. You know, you can kind of script some things, but Borderlands 2, Battlefield 3, uh, Skyrim. These are all games that you have to do manual run-throughs for. So somebody, when we when we test the graphics card, when we test Battlefield 3, we test 180 seconds of Battlefield 3 three times per resolution per video card. Uh, so it becomes very much not fun to play Battlefield 3 at that point because you've played the same 180 seconds of that game for about four hours. I'm having bad flashbacks to most of 1995, 1996, <laughs> 1997, 1998, 1999, where you, yeah. you get to the point where you're over the course of a year, you're watching a benchmark. You can basically be like, yeah, it's going to be yada. And it turns out just by watching the stuff flicker by at high speed, you can actually tell exactly what the final score is going to be. Cause you've watched the benchmark 7,000 times. Yeah. Frank. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was just saying it's fun. It's fun. Let's move on to Frank's question. We'll get Frank's in here. Should Frank build or buy? Thank you for producing an excellent show for techie folks that non-gamers can enjoy, too. You're welcome, Frank. We do our best. Frank's considering two options for his main machine in his photography studio. One, build a computer based on gaming specs, $1,200 to $1,500 for Photoshop, Lightroom, Premiere, etc. Uh, and that price is not including monitor, keyboard, or other input devices. Two, buy a used high-end gaming machine, e.g. Alienware or something someone built and built a new one. Is it worth the risk and money saved to buy a used gaming machine? Maybe certain parts are fried or incompatible. Is it worth the risk if there are few, or to me, if it is worth the risk, are there a few tips or software tricks to use when looking at machines? I am fairly computer illiterate with over 30 years playing with computers. Excuse me. I am fairly computer literate. (laughs) I'm so sorry, Frank. I am fairly... Computer literate with over 30 years of playing with computers, but they always I were either store-bought or upgrades that I did. Um, gotcha. You know, I'd also say, have you considered building your own machine? Not because you're going to save money, but because you'll enjoy the process. Um, mm-hmm. You know, oh, you did say build a computer based on gaming specs. Apparently, the late nights with the baby are starting to, to tell. Um, I, I think the, the real question is here is, he's building a machine for Photoshop, Lightroom, and Premiere. Right. Is a gaming machine spec really the way he wants to go. Um, I say for the most part, yes. The only place where it may not make sense, if you're, if you're going to choose the building option, you you don't need a super high end GPU, except you want to make sure you get a GPU that will do uh, the accelerated portions of Photoshop and premiere and that kind of stuff. Uh, So, you know, you may actually want to follow those gaming specifications. (laughs) Yeah. Pretty Pretty closely because you're going to have, you're going to want to get a higher end processor. Your CPU is still going to be more important than your GPU in those applications, but the GPU can become very useful as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Adobe has excellent information what GPU is going to work best with CS6 or CS5 or whatever you're working mm-hmm. with. I would also say sometimes you want to really avoid, unless you particularly like the case design or something special, because <laughs> um, a lot of times people buy a gaming machine, a pre-built gaming machine from a boutique manufacturer, and they spend a lot of money. 
and they want to get that money back out when they resell it. And you may be paying for really cool cables and windows in the case and a really stylish uh, case design when what you really want to pay for is as much memory and as much processor and an appropriate right. amount of GPU. Because like, you're in Photoshop, you're in Lightroom, you're in Premiere. What you want is ridiculous amounts of memory, the fastest CPU you can afford, and a ton of storage. And I don't think you really care about everything else that goes into a gaming machine. You know what I mean? In, into a boutique gaming Agreed. machine. Don't don't pay an you know don't pay an extra three four hundred dollars for a really cool case unless you're in love with the case. You know, and it makes the room. You know, I missed my rug. It, it, it pulled the whole room together. That Alienware case. It pulled the whole room together. Um, you know what I mean? Like, don't don't spend extra money for somebody else's old gaming machine when you can get all of their performance for less money without a with a less stylish case or or a less right. fantastic cable layout. Um, that's the cheap guy in me again, who was so excited about the six fifty and is no longer. And excited. then it gets shot down. That's right. Shot down. Oh my goodness! But Frank, uh, you know, I, I I would also say, you know, the nice thing about building your own machine is you get all the parts you want. So each and every time. <laughs> Just saying. Yep. Agreed. So, although I got to say, a, you know, a Core i7, somebody's two-year-old Core i7 system with 12 gigabytes of RAM would be really tempting right about now if they're itching to buy a new Ivy Bridge. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it, buying used computers is always a little bit risky. You don't right. really know. It's kind of like buying a used car. <laughs> you just, you're just kind of taking a chance on what it was used for. Um, you know, if they can... Like like a used car, if they can turn it on and you can drive it, that's about as good as you're going to get. If right. you can boot up the PC and they can show you it working and you know playing a game or something like that, then then that's as good as you're going to get. It all comes down to if you trust if you <laughs> trust the seller, right? So would I recommend going on Craigslist? No, probably right. not. Would I recommend buying from a friend? Or somebody you know, or a coworker, or something like that. It's like, oh yeah, I've got this machine that I don't really use anymore. It's got a crappy video card in it, but you could upgrade that relatively easy or something like that. Yeah. Then maybe maybe go down that route. Yeah, if, if they won't let you like run the machine, <laughs> and yeah, don't buy that. Don't buy it. Yeah, if they tell you it boots just fine, but they won't plug it into the monitor that's just sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, trust me, it works great. It works fine. Just... Don't, don't buy a used car from somebody who's asking you to tow it away. <laughs> don't buy a computer in a parking lot. Um, unless that's there's true. a parking, unless they plug it into a monitor in the parking lot and it runs. <laughs> they got a generator, you know, whatever. That's about it for this edition of Twitch <laughs> this week in computer hardware. Ryan, what's coming up on PC Per this week? Uh, we have a lot of stuff. We know <laughs> we've we've so coming up very soon. I don't know if it'll be next week. We are going to have. Uh, new processors to talk about from AMD. No surprise, it's going to be Trinity stuff. So we're going to see how those new APUs compare. Uh, very shortly thereafter, we'll talk about the new um, pile driver discrete. I keep saying discrete. The the non APU. We'll just talk about the CPUs, right? These are the ones that are going to be supposedly a little bit higher powered, maybe a little bit more of the FX brand and that kind of stuff. Um, so it it'll be. It'll be interesting. We're going to have to get back into the whole swing of CPU things. We've been focused on GPUs for so long, basically since Ivy Bridge was released. Um, so booting all those machines back up and making sure uh, that we have all the updated stuff on them is probably what's going on this week. How about TechZilla? Um, actually, uh, Robert Heron's going to be on on Monday. Veronica, of course, getting married Saturday night. Going on a honeymoon, leaving me and the TechZilla audience alone. Uh, actually, leaving me and the TechZilla audience with Robert, which should be kind of fun. Um we, uh, we're going to be talking about Ethernet switches, like how do you pick an Ethernet switch, USB battery packs. We've got the Eton Ruckus, which is our solar-powered Bluetooth speaker system. Uh, Pelican's new uh, backpack series, they've, they've done a, a consumer. Apparently, it's kind of funny. I, I keep laughing. Pelican decided they didn't have – Pelican, the case manufacturers, right. decided that they didn't have a uh, – they weren't recognizable enough to consumers. So they came up with a consumer brand. We're going to talk about the new Pelican backpack. Uh, <laughs> And uh, with a little bit of luck, Wednesday, we'll finally have my assessment of life with a $35 desktop PC, a.k.a. what happens when you use oh, yeah. a Raspberry Pi for your primary work machine. So, uh, Shout out to Kevin Lloyd, who is on Twitter, who posted a picture of him watching Twitch live on his TV. Nice. And my hair looks like it needs a haircut in that picture, too. So I guess <laughs> I'll have to do that this week. Yeah, we both need haircuts. We're getting shaggy. <laughs> That's it for Twitch. It is. <laughs> this week in computer hardware. <laughs> Quick reminder to email oh. us your questions, guys. Twitch, 
T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. Um, make sure that there is only one T in that word. I've, I've, we were using twitch.tv for video streaming as well this week, and I kept screwing it up in the spelling going back and forth. So T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. And, of course, if you want to share the show, send everybody to twit.tv slash twitch. And you can find the ways to subscribe through iTunes or whatever your favorite podcast app happens to be these days. You can also email or email us. <laughs> We're not giving out our personal email addresses. Not today. Um, mm-hmm. But Twitter us, uh, Ryan Shrout, at Ryan Shrout, at Patrick Norton. Uh, and uh, apparently I'm just going to quit before the baby tiredness. We can absolutely do that. Kills us all. <laughs> oh, my goodness. PCPer.com is Ryan Shrout's website. Techzilla.com is mine. T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-L-P-C-P-E-R.com. And that's it for this edition of Twitch. I'm Patrick Dorton. I'm Ryan Shrout. We'll see you next week. (laughs) I see you have a... New is that new tape on the back of the laptop? It is new tape. I got my my freshly repaired MacBook oh, that's Air right. back. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. So I actually have a screen that has pixels on it, not giant dark sections of pain and cracked LCD. I'm suffering. using I'm using uh, one of these new Lenovo X1 Carbons. I had my grubby little paws on one of those yesterday, and it was I was talking to uh, Francois from Intel. Oh, I should have told everybody about the the Intel performance interview we talked about. Uh, on Texilla. But yeah, I I like I was I basically said to him, I bet Ryan Shrout's gonna buy one of these. Oh, you know what? Uh yeah, we had that conversation uh <laughs> when I was at IDF, Francois and I. And I tell you what, I really like it. I'm not the R key pops up, like the R key is broken, like if you hit the left hand side of it, the right hand side of it flips up, like there's a little like and I took the key off and there's a little piece of plastic that's broken. Off of the scissor, off of the, is it the scissor key? Is, yeah. is this a loaner? It is. It's a review sample. So they uh, sent you a broken review sample or you broke the review sample? I might have broken it, but I was only typing. It's not like I was hitting it with a hammer. You, so you so, claim. So I claim, yeah. It's, that's true. Uh, and I've I'm, heard that before. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to buy a new notebook. I need a new notebook. I was deciding between this Lenovo X1 Carbon, uh-huh. uh, Samsung Series 9, which is... Really nice. Sexy looking laptop, yeah. And then going back to old reliable, the Lenovo X230, which is a 12 and a half inch screen, but it has a nine cell battery and I can get a six cell slice, which gets you like 20 hours of battery life. It's not cool. It's not cool looking. It's not sexy. And it looks like the same laptop I've had for the last five years because I've had X201s. But damn it, they just work. You know, and I don't know. I'm still, I'm trying to see what, if the battery life of the X1 Carbon actually kind of feels like it's enough. I don't know. That's the problem with these Ultrabooks is that they're so small, so skinny that they just don't have room for giant batteries like I like. It's good to have, it's good to have computers that work. Well, they're claiming like eight hours of battery life off of that now, which is a big That's improvement. total bull crap. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. It's, I mean, I bet I can get five hours out of it of, and I'm not doing, like I'm browsing the internet. Like that's what I do. I use Gmail and I use Gmail essentially is all I do. Right. And we, and the website administration is a website. So I'm not doing anything super high powered here. Um, And it, and it lasts, it feels like it lasts a, a five hour window, you know, and it's, it's nice, but my X201 is down to about four hours of battery life just because the battery's getting old and all that kind of stuff. But it reboots and it has all kinds of other issues. That's why I want another machine. I just, I keep telling myself, uh, you know what? I deserve it. I want a cool looking, sexy laptop now. I've had this X201 that is a, you know, it's small. It's not super thin, but it's, it's a business machine. Like it, if you pull that out, it's like, well, you know, Ryan, you're not in it for the style. If you're going to be a hipster, you have to get a Mac. Yeah, but I don't. I'm not a hipster. That's that's not the issue. I don't know. I just I want this laptop with eight hours, with actually eight hours of battery life. Do they have a slice that'll like double the thickness and give you the battery life you want? Well, they don't have. That's they don't. They don't have. 
like there's no port on the bottom of it. Right. I mean, you, it's not a removable battery, even, you know, that kind of stuff. That Chuck it. Chuck it. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's really nice. The, the the broken key makes me wonder, makes me worry about like the long term viability of it. But and wait, then, you, you probably didn't get it new though. It's probably not. You're not the first person to get it. I am not. I am not the first person so to have it. Our, our laptop it's, reviewer it's a Matt key had it first. from your other. Yeah, and if I bought a new one and it got a broken key, I know there's a warranty and all that kind of stuff. But I just, I'm I don't know. You. I'm Patrick Norton, and this is the show where we try to tell you the most important news and tell you what hardware to buy and what hardware you might want to avoid. Avoid? Avoid. <laughs> Ryan, look at how, look at the pain on Ryan's face. He's like, quick, before the internet falls down again. <laughs> yeah, it could happen at any moment.